أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا فتحنا لك فتحا مبينا ليغفر لك الله ما تقدم من ذنبك وما تأخر ويتم نعمته عليك ويهديك ويهديك صراطا مستقيما وينصرك الله نصرا عزيزا هو الذي أنزل السكينة في قلوب المؤمنين ليزدادوا إيمانا مع إيمانهم ولله جنود السماوات والأرض وكان الله عليما حكيما ليدخل المؤمنين والمؤمنات جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها ويكفر ويكفر عنهم سيئاتهم وكان ذلك عند الله فوزا عظيما ويعذب المنافقين والمنافقات والمشركين والمشركات الظانين بالله ظن السوء عليهم دائرة السوء وغضب الله عليهم ولعنهم وأعد لهم جهنم وساءت نصيرا ولله جنود السماوات والأرض وكان الله عزيزا حكيما إنا أرسلناك شاهدا ومبشرا ونذيرا لتؤمنوا بالله ورسوله وتعزروه وتوقروه وتسبحوه بكرة وأصيلا إن الذين يبايعونك إنما يبايعون الله يد الله فوق أيديهم فمن نكث فإنما ينكث على نفسه ومن أوفى بما عاهد عليه الله فسيؤتيه أجرا عظيما سيقول لك المخلفون من الأعراب شغلتنا أموالنا وأهلنا فاستغفر لنا يقولون بألسنتهم ما ليس في قلوبهم قل فمن يملك لكم من الله شيئا إن أراد بكم ضرا أو أراد بكم نفعا بل كان الله بما تعملون خبيرا بل ظننتم أن لن ينقلب الرسول والمؤمنون إلى أهليهم أبدا وزين ذلك في قلوبكم وظننتم ظن السوء وظننتم ظن السوء وكنتم قوما بورا ومن لم يؤمن بالله ورسوله فإنا أعتدنا للكافرين سعيرا ولله ملك السماوات والأرض يغفر لمن يشاء ويعذب من يشاء كان الله غفورا رحيما We see so many Muslims nowadays who know about British history in detail they can tell you about Henry VIII and his six wives but then when you ask them about our own history like who built Mecca or the story of Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam or the difference between the Sunnah and Shia, we as Muslims, a lot of us don't know that. And that's such a problem because when we don't understand our own history, we can't love that history and we can't love 
our holy sites, Mecca, Medina, and Al-Aqsa. And when we don't love those holy sites, there's no way we can protect them and defend them. So I think that's an important message from this talk, that we should learn about Islamic history to defend our Islamic heritage. Another important point, I guess, from this talk is that Salah al-Din, he is such an amazing leader. And the reason he's so amazing in Islam is because he came at a time when there was no hope for Muslims. He came at a time when Muslim leaders worldwide were completely indifferent to Muslim suffering. He came at a time when the West were attacking Islam both physically and mentally. They were saying that Muslims are infidels. They were saying that Muslims should be eradicated so Christianity can flourish. And at the same time, they were entering Muslim countries and you know, taking over and killing Muslim citizens. And I think we see Salah al-Din as being so distant from us. We see him as being in a different world. But if we think about it, there are so many parallels to our life today. Today, we have Muslim leaders who all they care about is money and power and passing that power down from son to son. And at the same time, we're facing, you know, serious attacks from the West, both bombing on Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and also mentally, where Western governments are, you know, Western governments, Western media are saying Muslims are terrorists, Muslims should be deported. And the difference between Salah al-Din's time and our time today is that we don't have a Salah al-Din. And it's up to us to try and become the Salah al-Din that we want to see in our world. We need to become the Salah al-Din in whichever field we go into, whether that field is medicine, whether it's law, whether engineering, whether history or English. We need to excel and lead in those fields. And when we lead, then if an attack happens or when an attack happens on Al-Aqsa or on Mecca or on Medina, not only can we condemn that attack, but we can try and stop it, inshallah. So um, I'll pass over to Didi Hussain, who we were honored to have. He is a British journalist. He is co-founder and co-editor of the Islamic um, website Five Pillars. He also writes for the Huffington Post, Al Jazeera, and Middle East Eye and has also appeared on several news channels, including um, Sky News, BBC News, and Islam Channel. Um, the talk should last 30 minutes, inshallah, and then after that we'll have a question and answer session where you guys can ask about Salah um, al-Din or about Dili Hussein's career in journalism. I don't want to bore you. So, um, without further ado, Dili Hussein. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته brothers and sisters so many people in the room yet the, the return of the salam was so quiet السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام الحمد لله أصلا إذا شاء الله I want to begin by thanking uh, UCL ISOC for inviting me to deliver this talk. As far as you know, what a monumental task I have at hand. Discuss the Salah al-Din Ayyubi and the Battle of Al-Aqsa in half an hour. When entire books, lectures, in some universities and institutions you do modules on these topics. Uh, so I have the near impossible task to deliver this talk in the space of half an hour. So. Uh, Make dua that I do, uh, do it some justice, uh, albeit very remote. One of the questions Sister Maria asked me in the email, she asked me, Brother Dili, uh, why did you want to do this talk? Oh, is, is there a case of personal interest? And she went, don't mind me asking. And I didn't mind at all, because it's a very important question. Is it of personal interest? And the answer is, the issue of Masjid al-Aqsa, Jerusalem, and the land that's 
known as Al Sham, which is Syria, Palestine, Lebanon, and parts of Jordan, is something that should be very deep rooted in our hearts. Because it was, it was for the Prophet, it was for his companions, it was for the Khulafa who came after, and it certainly was for Salahuddin Ayyubi. And whenever we discuss not only Salahuddin Ayyubi's life, but generally heroes within Islamic history, we tend to sometimes have a very romanticized concept. Yani, we hear these stories and then we leave the room and the iman or the hope or the zeal decreases. It becomes really like a bedtime story kind of thing. So please, brothers and sisters, whatever khayr comes out of today's lecture, do not let it decrease when you leave, inshallah. And this topic in on itself stirs a lot of emotion. Because there's a lot of political relevance, a lot of religious relevance, spiritual relevance. And it's a topic regarding an area which is dear not only to Islam and Muslims, but to Christians and the Jewish people. So keep this in mind. Keep this in mind that this topic here that we're going to discuss today is no light topic. And as Sister Mariam rightly stated, there are so many comparisons and, and, and similarities to the time of Salahuddin Ayyubi and the situation of the Muslim world then and our situation today. And I'll go on to explain that uh, later on in the talk. So, before I start, there's going to be a number of terminologies that I'm going to use um, besides Al-Aqsa or Masjid Al-Aqsa, so Jerusalem, Al-Sham, Bayt Al-Maqdis, Bayt Al-Maqdis is so the Quranic term that's referred to as Jerusalem. So, keep that in mind that if I'm not using the word Al-Aqsa, I'm generally referring to the land that's known as Jerusalem or Al-Sham, which is Syria, Lebanon, Jordan and Palestine. So to begin with, let's try understanding why Masjid Al-Aqsa or this area known as Bayt Al-Maqdis or Al-Sham, why is it so dear to the Muslims? It was the first Qibla of the Muslims. It was the station of Al-Isra Al-Miraj, the miraculous night journey of our beloved Prophet. It was the second house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala built on this earth. It was the place where hundreds of prophets made Allah's uh, peace of blessing be upon them all are buried. It's the place where many of the companions of Allah are buried. It's a place where miracles took place by Allah's permission. It was a place which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to himself in the Quran as a blessed place. And within the Quran, there are 70 direct and indirect references it's the place where angels are descended with Allah's message. It's the only place on earth where all the Anbiya salam, prayed in Jama'ah behind Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And lastly, it's the only masjid mentioned by name in the Quran besides the Kaaba. And I want to just narrate some hadith to you, just so you can get an indication of how important it was. And I'm just going to narrate some hadith. There's many. There's some people that have said there's this around 40 to 50 hadith sahih, authentic hadith, directly talking about uh, Masjid al Aqsa, Bayt al Maqdis, and that area. And obviously, I said 70 indirect or direct references in the Quran. Regarding Masjid al Aqsa being a place where it's very important to visit. Abu Huraira radiallahu relates that the Prophet sallallahu said you should not undertake a special journey to visit any place other than the following three masjids with the expectations of getting greater reward the sacred masjid of Makkah, Kaaba Sharif this masjid of mine, Masjid al-Nabawi and Masjid al-Aqsa in Jerusalem this hadith in numerous wording, but the same message is mentioned in Sahih Muslim, Sahih Bukhari, and Sunan ibn Abu Dawood. Regarding Masjid al-Aqsa being the second house of Allah on earth, Abu Dar al-Ghifari reported that he asked the Prophet one day, O Messenger of Allah, which masjid was built first on earth? The Prophet replied, the sacred masjid of Makkah. Abu Dar again asked, which was next? The Prophet said, Masjid al-Aqsa. Abu Dhar then asked, 
How long was the period between the building of these two masjids? And the Prophet ﷺ replied, 40 years. And he concluded by saying, Apart from these, offer your prayer anywhere when it is time to pray, although excellence is in praying in these masjids. Mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. Regarding the importance of donating, giving sadaqah to Masjid Al-Aqsa, <coughs> Abdullah ibn Umar relates that he once asked the Prophet, O Messenger of Allah, tell us the legal injunction about visiting Bayt al-Maqdis. And the Prophet replied, go and pray there. And if you cannot visit it and pray there, then send some oil to be used in the lamps, mentioned in Bukhari. So as you can see, even sending oil for it to be used in the lamps of Masjid al-Aqsa was considered sadaqah. So imagine how rewarding it is to give money and clothes and so forth. Regarding it being the blessed land, Zayd ibn Thabit reports that the Prophet ﷺ said, How blessed is Al-Sham? The companions asked, Why is that, Ya Rasulullah? He replied, I see the angels of Allah spreading their wings over Al-Sham. Ibn Abbas and added, And the prophets lived therein. There is not a single inch of Al-Quds where a prophet has not prayed or an angel has not stood. Meshin Tirmidhi and Musnad Ahmad. Regarding Masjid Al-Aqsa and Jerusalem being a place for major events, the Messenger of Allah, upon him be peace, said regarding of the Jal, the Antichrist, that he will stay in the land for 40 days and he will enter every place on earth except the Kaaba, Masjid Al-Nabawi, Masjid Al-Aqsa and Mount Sinai, mentioned in Musnad Ahmed. Regarding the place where brave fighters and warriors will emerge from, Abu Hurairah relates that the Prophet said, A group of my ummah will not cease to fight at the gates of Damascus and at the gates of Jerusalem and its surroundings. The betrayal or desertion of whoever deserts them will not harm them in the least. They will remain victorious, standing for the truth until the final hour rises. Mention Tabarani. Let me quickly just add to this hadith fear. Prophet said that whoever betrays them and deserts them will make no difference. This is one of you know, the lessons of the people of that blessed land. That in fact we need them. We need to help them to expiate our sins and to relieve us of some of the things that we've done on this earth. We need them. They don't necessarily need us. They have Allah and His Messenger and the angels to protect them. That blessed land there. Running this, it being the site of a future Khilafah, a caliphate. No. ISIS, of course. <laughs> Abdullah ibn Hawala al-Azdi said, The Prophet peace be upon him put his hand on my head and said, Ibn Hawala, if you see that the Khilafah has taken abode in the Holy Land, then the earthquakes, tribulations and great events are at hand. The last hour on that day will be closer to people than my hand is to your head. Mentioned in Musnad Ahmad and Abu Dawood. And lastly, the beloved wife of the Prophet, peace be upon him, Aisha radiallahu anh, and reports that the Prophet, peace be upon him, used to recite Surah Al-Isra every night in his prayer. Glorified and exalted be he who took his slave for a journey by night from Masjid Al-Haram to the Father's Mosque in Jerusalem, the neighborhood whereof we have blessed in order that we might show him of our ayat. Verily, he is the all-hearer, the all-seer. Now that was just some insight of how important and how dear Masjid al-Aqsa and Jerusalem and the land of Al-Sham is to the Muslims. There are many, many, many more hadith. Um, so that was just a very brief insight. And I forgot to also add as well in the intro, the talk today is about Salahuddin Ayyubi and the Battle of Al-Aqsa. But I also included my own subheader there. From weakness to strength. Why is that? Because the history of Jerusalem, and generally speaking, that area, in the Islamic context has always been one about taking it from a state of weakness to a state of strength. And today, inshallah, this is something that we're going to explore. So, who was Salahuddin Ayyubi rahimahullah? <coughs> Can I see a show of hands to see that you all or don't know who Salahuddin Ayyubi is? Can I see hands? Who knows who Salahuddin Ayyubi is? Alhamdulillah. Okay. 
So Abdul Ayyubi is one of the greatest heroes in Islam. Arguably, also one of the greatest military leaders in human history. He was the liberator of Jerusalem, who defeated the Crusaders after 88 years of occupation. His real name was Salahuddin Yusuf al Ayyubi. He was born in Tikrit in 1138. He was raised in Mosul in the house of the Zengids. The Zengids were a Muslim dynasty at the time, and we touch upon them later as well. And he spent most of his adult life and then eventually died in Damascus. He was of Kurdish descent, he was Sunni, he followed the Hanafi Madhab, and he was an adherent of the Ashari school of theology. And he was a Quran Hafiz and a scholar in his own right. He was a deeply religious man, very spiritual. Someone who, when he used to hear the Quran being recited or a hadith being recited, he used to sit down because he felt that standing was a form of disrespect. He should cry whenever he used to hear the ayat of Allah being recited. He was someone who took the study of hadith very seriously. He was someone who studied jihad very deeply. He was a religious man. He was a very spiritual man. He used to fast often, pray tahajjud. He used to make his soldiers pray tahajjud. But he was a man of action and a man of substance. He was truly a balanced leader, something that we'll look into later on in the talk, inshallah. He was a man of honor who kept to his promises and treaties whilst having the affairs of the Muslim ummah constantly on his mind. He used to give him sleepless nights, Yani. When he used to eat, and even then, people used to be like, you know, he didn't used to eat much. But when he did eat, he never used to smile. And there was a man called Bahaddin ibn Shaddad. Ibn Shaddad was basically his chronicler. He was the, he was the man who followed Salahuddin Ayyubi around and wrote his biography. So Ibn Shaddad once asked him, Ya Salahuddin, why don't you smile often? Even when you've not eaten for days, even when, you, when you've got some sustenance, you don't smile. Even Ya Ibn Shaddad, how can I smile when Jerusalem and Masjid al-Aqsa is occupied by the Crusaders? This is the kind of man he was. And even his opponents, the Crusaders, people who opposed him, hated Islam, considered us to be devil worshippers, and the followers of the Antichrist, even they couldn't speak ill of Salahuddin Ayyubi. And to quote one man, his name was William of Tyre, the most famous and well-known crusader chronicler. He said regarding Salahuddin Ayyubi, to paraphrase, he was valiant in war and generous beyond measure. This was a crusader chronicler, someone who was ideologically, religiously opposed, diametrically opposed to everything that Salahuddin Ayyubi stood for. Yet, even his opponents could not deny the kind of man that he was, the kind of spiritual, religious, compassionate, merciful, honorable man that he was. At the height of his power, his sultanate, it included Egypt, Hijaz, Yemen, Syria, eventually Jerusalem, he had liberated all these lands, parts of North Africa as well. He epitomized everything that unfortunately we do not see from the leaders today. What do we see from the leaders today unfortunately? We see weakness, treachery, submissiveness, no izza, no care, total and utter apathy, disconnected, too concerned with the dunya. Yet Salahuddin Ayyubi was the diametric opposite. That's the kind of man he was. And just to add a bit of context, when Salahuddin Ayyubi took Egypt from the Fatimids, he was offered the palace of the former Sultan of the Fatimids. And that palace had 4,000 rooms. 12,000 inhabitants, majority of whom were women. 
he refused to live there. But I'm not going to live in this. Even though I am now taken over and I'm the new Sultan, I'm not going to live in this place. I'm not living in that house. So he gave that away to a sadaqah. He gave that towards the Baytul Mal. This is the kind of man that he was. He didn't live lavishly. Like his contemporaries. And nor did he live lavishly like the leaders of today. <coughs> What was the situation of Al-Aqsa and that region at the time of Salah al As mentioned earlier, it was very similar to that the situation of today. The Muslim world was divided, disunited, weak, oppressed, occupied. Egypt was under the Fatimids. The Fatimids were an Ismaili, which are a sect within Shaism. They had occupied Egypt for 280 years. Who's heard of Al-Azhar University? Al-Azhar? Al-Azhar for 280 years was under Ismaili leadership and scholarship. The Sunni heritage of Egypt had gone. But the Fatimids themselves were very problematic. They used to regularly and consistently side with the Crusaders. This is well cited in, in, in Muslim and by non-Muslim historians. Jerusalem had been occupied since 1099. 88 years it had been occupied. And just to touch upon how they conquered it, when they entered Jerusalem in 1099, SubhanAllah, they murdered 70,000 Muslims in three days of massacre. They desecrated Masjid al-Aqsa, desecrated Dome of the Rock, bashed the heads of babies and I forgot the, the Latin term that they should use but they should throw babies across the wall and say God wills it, God wills it raped women left, right and centre it was a bloodbath it was truly a bloodbath the Christian historians they, they, they wrote about this William of Tyre who I, who I cited in the, in the previous slide he described how they took Jerusalem it was a bloody affair it was gory The life of Salahuddin Ayyubi cannot be discussed without mentioning very briefly a man called Nur al-Din al-Zengi. Nur al-Din al-Zengi was a giant of Islam as well. So when I said that Salahuddin Ayyubi was raised in the house of the Zengids in Mosul, he was raised by Nur al-Din al-Zengi. Nur al-Din al-Zengi was like Salahuddin's mentor teacher, like a near father-like figure. And many have argued that it was actually Nur al-Din al-Zengi who paved the way for the liberation of Al-Aqsa uh, and Jerusalem and, and everything and all the accomplishments that Salahuddin achieved with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because Nur al-Din al-Zengi had those traits. A deeply spiritual man, a deeply religious man, a just ruler, a man who understood the problems of the Ummah, the man who understand understood that the situation and the solution had to come from Islam. He, he was also that balanced leader. And of course, when he raised Salahuddin Ayyubi, it was, only, it, it was inevitable that he was going to pick up the traits and the characteristics of his mentor. And Ruddin Zengi had a three-point plan. The first point was that the Fatimids had to either be defeated or removed. Secondly, the Muslim armies and the lands had to become united, realign themselves with the Abbasid Caliphate in Baghdad. And after those two things were accomplished, then we need to head towards Jerusalem. None of that happened in Nuruddin Zengi's lifetime. But it did happen in the lifetime of his student, his son, nephew type figure within his lifetime. And so in 1163, Nuruddin Zengi, he sent Salahuddin Ayyubi to Egypt because the Fatimids at that time used to have minor skirmishes with the Crusaders. So they asked for Salahuddin Amir Nuruddin Zengi's assistance. Said, that, look, yani, we need some help. You know, we're having skirmishes with the Crusaders. But at the same time, when it, when it suited them, they'd also conspire and fight the Muslims. But at that time, they required some help. And Nur al-Din Zengi was, besides being a spiritual and, and a religious man, he was also an astute politician. And he said, Ya Salahuddin, 
Yalla, go make your way to Egypt and assist the Fatimids. And Salahuddin Ayyubi had a number of successive military victories, as well as being a good friend of the Ismaili Fatimid Sultan, Sultan al Adid. So eventually, as a result of having a few victorious battles and being a good friend of the Sultan, he was then promoted to the rank of Vizier or Wazir. And this position was unheard of at the time. For a Sunni Muslim to have the position of Wazir or Vizier in an in a Ismaili establishment or state was unheard of. And that happened in 1171. It was also in 1171 where Sultan al Adid died. And within a very short space of time, being the most second powerful man in Egypt, quick transition, some may describe it as a military coup, some may describe it as an organic transition, however you want to read history, Salahuddin Ayyubi took over Egypt. So that was Nuruddin Zengi's first point completed. After Sultan al Adid died, he was already the second most highest ranking politician or ruler, and as soon as the Sultan died, took over, and he became the leader of Egypt. And from then onwards, Salahuddin Ayyubi spent nearly 10 years, 10 years trying to unify the Muslim armies. Because at that time, there were a number of small kingdoms and fiefdoms, a number of Seljuk princes that were always at each other's throat, were fighting each other. And if they weren't fighting each other, they'd be conspiring against each other with the Crusaders. Very disunited, a lot of fitna. So he spent, and some scholars have said this, he spent nearly 10 years fighting Muslims than the Crusaders. And he had to do this. And in fact, one of the Seljuk princes once asked Salahuddin, Ya Salahuddin, move on. Stop fighting us. There's no need for this unity. He replied, I wouldn't care if there were dozens and hundreds of Muslim rulers, I wouldn't bother fighting you or trying to unite you. But the fact that Jerusalem is occupied, this is a must. This is a must. So he spent 10 years from after becoming the ruler of Egypt and then after Nur al-Din Zengi's death, the ruler of Syria, he became the Sultan. He spent 10 years fighting <coughs> a lot of Muslim princes who didn't care about Jerusalem didn't care about repelling or removing the Crusaders. They were too busy trying to maintain or expand their own little kingdoms, whilst at the same time conspiring with the Crusaders. He spent 10 years, keep that in mind, he spent 10 years fighting Muslims for the sake of unity. <coughs> now, after that 10 year period, the situation was sort of ripe. Things had started to change. Hope had started to increase. And there was a treaty that Salahuddin Ayyubi had with a man called Raymond of Tripoli. And it was due to expire in 1186. Raymond of Tripoli was a count. He was like a nobleman. Not exactly the ranking of a king, but a very high ranking. And this treaty was coming close to expiring in 1186. And Salahuddin Ayyubi, rahimullah, he refused for two legitimate reasons to renew this treaty. The first reason was due to a man called Reginald of Chatillon. Reginald of Chatillon was a crusader. This man had no regard for laws, for treaties. He should regularly kill the hujjaj, the pilgrims. He should loot their caravan. He in fact said that I'm going to march to Medina and I'm going to bet, I'm going to dig up the, the body of that camel herder, Na'udhu Billah, he's referring to the Prophet He said, I'm going to dig his body up, I'm going to take him to my palace and I'm going to charge the Muslims to come and see the body of their Prophet. This is the kind of shaitan that he was. Even to the extent that even the crusaders were like, my, my God, this guy, 
you know, we can't control him, he's constantly breaching treaties. So Salahuddin regarded him as being part of the Crusaders, therefore he was one of the clauses behind why he didn't want to renew that treaty because he was transgressing any laws, any um, understandings, um, so that was one of the reasons. The second reason was, as a result of that 10 year campaign to unify the Muslims, Alhamdulillah, with the blessings of Allah, the army had now grew, grown to huge numbers. Strong. You know, the Iman was there, unified. And it just didn't make sense to renew a treaty which prevented them marching to Jerusalem. And in essence, the situation was now ripe to go towards Jerusalem. So, before I go into some of the details as to what actually happened in Hattin and what led to it happening, the ulama and the historians understanding of Hattin was that it was one of the greatest battles in Islam after the previous great battles of Badr, Uhud, Qadasiha, Yarmouk, Yamama and all these great battles. The ulama ranked it up there after those great battles at the time of the Prophet and the companions. Why? Because the implications that this victory had on the situation of the Muslims. The Battle of Hittin took place on July the 4th in 1187 in a place called Hattin, which was in the north of Palestine and it was mid-summer, very hot. And Hittin illustrated the kind of master tactician that Salahuddin Ayyubi was in the battlefield. In the sense that he led the army to a town called Tiberius. Tiberius was the city where the Christian king of Jerusalem, his wife, was residing. So the king of Jerusalem, who was a crusader, who was a Christian, his wife was residing in a city called Tiberius, including his children. So Saladin Ayyubi marched there. He didn't, have, he, he didn't intend to attack Tiberius, the forts of Tiberius. Why did he do it? Because he knew that if the Muslim army marched towards Tiberius, if they marched towards Tiberius, the king of Jerusalem, whose name was Guy de Lezon, he would go on para mode. He would be like, yeah, I need my wife there, my children there, they're going to attack my wife and children. But the reason why he did it was because the army would leave Jerusalem in their high numbers and they would march in the hot day and they'd arrive in Tiberius tired. And that's exactly what happened. The Crusaders brought a huge army all the way from Jerusalem, they marched to Tiberias, which left Jerusalem unprotected, without an army, and it left it without a king. So now it was vulnerable, it was weak. And by the time they arrived in Tiberias, Salahuddin Ayyubi rahimahullah, he had poisoned all the wells, he burnt brushwood, because alhamdulillah, with the permission of Allah, that day the wind was blowing towards the Crusader army, so he burnt brushwood, so the smoke was going towards that direction, so they were tired, they were thirsty, they were disorientated due to the smoke. And the final blow, and the final blow was the taking of the true cross. The true cross was a religious relic or ornament that the Christians wrongly believed that Prophet Isa was crucified on. And they should take this true cross to all their battles. And they should think that because we've got this true cross, we're victorious. Salahuddin Ayyubi knew this. And he knew that if he could possess, if he could take that true cross, they are finished. The morale is finished. So they're already tired, thirsty, disorientated. Many of them have been killed because the archers were strategically placed to shower them with arrows. But Salahuddin Ayyubi wanted to finish it off. So he sent a battalion to directly attack the knights that were defending the true cross. And alhamdulillah, the Muslims possessed the true cross. Khalas, it was finished. That was done. Hattin was a magnificent victory and a colossal defeat for the Crusaders. Their king, their entire religious leadership, 
all their knights had either been killed or captured. And one historian said that so many had died, there were so many dead bodies there, that we thought that none were alive. Then we looked at all those that were captured, and we were like, there were so many that had been captured, we thought none of them died. That was the situation of Hittin that day. And it was, a, it was truly a magnificent victory. It was truly a situation changer, it was a game changer. It was a decisive battle which led to the liberation of Jerusalem. And after the victory of Hittin, Salahuddin Ayyubi took the coastal cities of Acre, Nablus, Haifa, Toran, Beirut, and then he set his eyes to Jerusalem. Salahuddin Ayyubi, after taking those cities and towns after the Battle of Hittin, he marched towards Jerusalem. And he wanted to take Jerusalem without shedding any blood. Compare this to the very brief description I gave you of how the Crusaders took Jerusalem in 1099. <laughs> killing babies, raping women, killing 70,000 Muslim men, expelling the Jews, even expelling and robbing the Greek Orthodox Christians. The Christians that reached out to Western Europe to help them, even they were expelled or looted. He didn't want to shed any blood. So he conveyed this, but the crusader leadership of Jerusalem at the time arrogantly didn't want to give up. And they were like, we either fight to death, but we will not hand it over to you peacefully. So Salahuddin Ayyubi laid siege to Jerusalem and it lasted between seven to ten days. Um, and Alhamdulillah, on the Friday the 2nd of October 1187, Jerusalem was liberated. And the liberation of Jerusalem on that day exemplified the Islamic etiquettes, the Islamic principles of mercy, compassion, forgiveness, rahmah that he showed to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the Franks. During the siege, Salahuddin Ayyubi didn't offer any terms of protection because he said, look, I, I offered you guys without any bloodshed, without any violence, to give up the city. Yet you arrogantly refused, so why should I offer you uh, terms of protection? And there was a man under the name of, bear with me a moment, Balian of Ibelin. Balian of Ibelin was a nobleman, a crusader nobleman, who was de facto ruler of Jerusalem in the absence of the king, and, and, and all the leadership had been either killed or captured in Hattin. And this man, Balian, he said that if you don't offer me terms of protection, I'm going to kill all the Muslims in Jerusalem, which numbered around 5,000, and I'm going to desecrate the Dome of the Rock and Masjid al-Aqsa. So think about this for a moment. Initially, Salahuddin Ayyubi didn't want any bloodshed. The Crusaders arrogantly refused. Then when he laid siege, they wanted terms of protection. And they threatened to kill the Muslims within the Jerusalem and to desecrate the Masjids. So as is the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and his rightly guided Khulafa and the Khulafa that came after, he made shura. He sought the advice of his council and said, they're going to kill the Muslims. They're going to desecrate Masjid al-Aqsa. He could have, if he wanted to, say to Balian, go for it. We're going to enter Jerusalem anyway. No, no, go, go kill the Muslims, go desecrate the masjid. We're going to enter it anyway. But he didn't. He offered terms near enough immediately. And that wasn't a sign of weakness. This demonstrates how important Salahuddin Ayyubi regarded the blood of the Muslims and the sanctity of Masjid al-Aqsa that he couldn't bear being responsible for the shedding of more Muslim blood even though victory was just there it was just there they knew that 7 to 10 days we're going to take Jerusalem so this just shows how important he regarded Muslim life, Muslim blood generally peace 
and the sanctity of Masjid al-Aqsa. So after the terms of protection were given, the Franks, the Crusaders accepted. And against the advice of his treasurers, his financial advisors, he set a very low ransom for the Franks. And there were hundreds, if not thousands of Christian families who couldn't even afford this low ransom. They were pardoned. They were allowed to leave unharmed with all their possessions. In fact, it was narrated by Ibn Shaddad that some of the Christian families that couldn't afford the ransom had elderly men. But Salahuddin Ayyubi saw this, he used to give them horses and say, Yalla, you're old, travel in peace, travel in comfort. And also, after the liberation of Jerusalem, Salahuddin Ayyubi summoned the Jewish people who were expelled by the Crusaders in 1099. And he told them, come back and resettle. It's open to you. And he told the Greek Orthodox Christians that were also expelled, come back and resettle. And he told the Europeans that whilst I'm driving you out of Jerusalem, you're more than welcome to return for pilgrimage safely, unharmed. This is my word to you. Again, another demonstration of the kind of leader Salahuddin Ayyubi was. And under true Islamic rule, how religious tolerance is implemented, how Islam and Muslims has always peacefully coexisted with Ahl al-Kitab, with other religious faiths, how we do not transgress the rights of the Vidmi. He exemplified that. And this is from the Sunnah of the Prophet and the Khulafa. And even if you read up to the history of Palestine, or up until the time of the Ottomans, Jews, Christians and Muslims lived in peace, in security. And this was always the case. Salahuddin Ayyubi, he could have sought revenge that day. He could have. Many of his soldiers and generals were thinking, why? Why can't we enslave their women and children? Why can't we do a bloodbath just like they, they, they committed the massacre against us in 1099? So then you be said, La, this is not from Islam. This isn't. We've offered terms of protection. They've given up the city. We lead by example. And perhaps they may go back to Europe and share the news with the people of how Islam sets a moral high ground. And this relates back to how Prophet entered Makkah. That when he entered Makkah, some of the Sahaba, some of the <coughs> soldiers in the, in the army that numbered 10,000, they were saying, this is the day of revenge upon entering Makkah. When Prophet Sallam Fatah Makkah, when he entered, some of his soldiers were saying, this is the day of revenge. Prophet Sallam called Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas and said, go tell them this is the day of mercy. And we all know that when the Prophet Sallam entered Makkah, after such a long time of persecution and how the Muslims were tortured, how they were oppressed, that he could have taken revenge against Quraysh, but he didn't. So we see that trait in Salahuddin Ayyubi, that he could have taken revenge. And many would have seen it as it was justified. In fact, it was an international norm of that time that a conquering army if they take a city which they had to fight for, the women and children are enslaved, men are either sold or killed, done. This was an international norm at the time. But he didn't do that. He set that example. He set that moral high ground. Richard the Lionheart was an English crusader king that was sent after the liberation of Jerusalem. And he described Salahuddin Ayyubi as as long as a man like Salahuddin controls Jerusalem we the crusaders will never take it this was a crusader king and that's how we describe Salahuddin Ayyubi 
Saudi Ayubi died in 1193, age 55 in Damascus. He has 16 children. And do you know what he left behind? In terms of material wealth? One dinar and 47 dirhams. That wasn't even enough to pay for the shroud to cover his body for his burial. They had to borrow money from Baytul Mal for his janazah. This is the man who unified the Muslim lands, who if he wanted to, could have had everything that he wanted from the material and dunya sense, and maybe the Sharia and Allah and, and, and Islam would have allowed it. That he deserved all these worldly gains. It was the spoils of war. It was his paycheck, it was his salary. But no, this is what he left behind. One dinar and 47 dirhams. Put that into perspective. To the rulers of today, from Morocco all the way to Indonesia, from Central Asia all the way south down to Somalia, just think of the rulers. How many of them would leave this amount of money as their inheritance? But they can't even afford their, their shroud. And this is why history will remember individuals like Salahuddin Ayyubi. This is why. There were Khalifs and Sultans and Seljuk princes at his time. But we don't know their names. They live lavish lifestyles, but they don't remember, we don't remember those names. They were never mentioned. Similarly, the tyrants and the dictators of today, they'll never be remembered. Because they're not men of caliber, they're not men of substance. And this is why Salahuddin Ayyubi will forever be remembered, because this is the kind of man that he was. Now, it's all good and well to discuss the liberation of Jerusalem, to talk about the life of Salahuddin Ayyubi, get a bit of an Imam booster, think, yes, yeah, subhanAllah, you know, fantastic, and just continue relating back to that great history. And as I mentioned, then leave the door, hour, two hours later, you forget. At least it happens, we're humans. It happens. Even the, the companions, you should say to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, when we're with you, our Iman is up here. But when we go home, we spend time with our, our wives and our children, it's as if all the talk about Jannah and Jahannam and all that kind of stuff is gone. The Prophet said, don't worry. This is normal. This is normal. So it's, it's understandable that we do relate and hear nostalgic, romanticized stories of our history and then it sort of, you know, leaves our system and we go back to reality, we go back to our routine and they sort of, like I said, become <coughs> bedtime stories. Stories that just give us a bit of shiver down our spine, feel a bit warm and nice and then we come back to reality and think, oh my the situation is pretty bad. So let's look at Salahuddin's solution. Let's take some lessons from his life. So, as I mentioned earlier, the condition of the Muslim world at the time of Salahuddin Ayyubi very similar to that of today, if not identical. We were oppressed, occupied, humiliated, weak. And if we weren't occupied by foreign invaders, or foreign forces, we were being ruled by their agent rulers. By, their, by those tyrants that are on the paycheck, indirectly or directly, of foreign invader forces. As Salahuddin Ayyubi's solution was one that was from Islam. And I was speaking to a brother earlier that you cannot discuss Salahuddin Ayyubi's life or the, the Battle of Al Aqsa. Or any of that without mentioning that J word. Everyone know what that J word is? <laughs> the one that we can't mention unless, like, you know, we might get watched and spied on. Yeah, that word's called jihad. You can't, dis you, you can't talk about the life of Salahuddin Ayyubi and the liberation of Al Aqsa without talking about that J word. Yeah? But inshallah, we'll touch upon that a bit later on. But that was the solution. That was the solution. That was his solution. He didn't, he didn't seek no resolution. 
or any lifetime treaties or Camp David Accords. He, he didn't call for any of that. He knew the situation. He knew that for 88 years, Jerusalem had been occupied. The Muslim world was apathetic. It wasn't doing nothing. Muslims were being killed. Muslims were fighting each other. His solution was from Islam. And the brother there, he recited from Surah Fatah. Yeah? Victory. And what kind of victory are we looking at in this modern day and age? It certainly won't come from UN, or NATO, or EU, or OIC. But anyway, the liberation of Jerusalem at the time of Salahuddin and Yubi was a military one. So we can discuss perhaps in the Q&A that I too will say that the liberation of, of Al-Aqsa and Jerusalem and all the Muslim lands, if it's occupied, is a military one. But even that has a context and some, and some conditions. And perhaps we can discuss this later. The Muslim rulers of today, they were also like the rulers at the time of Muhammad and Ayyubi. They were either fighting each other or too concerned about their worldly gains and their national interests or their own internal tribalism. And this is what we see today as well. Apathetic, selfish, treacherous, spineless. And why was this? Because just like those warring princes at the time of Salahuddin and Ayyubi, they had no taqwa. They did not fear Allah. They do not think that we are going to die and we have to answer to Allah on Yawmil Qiyamah about what we did about the situation in Jerusalem, the situation of the Muslims. And this is simply put, that's why the situation it is. They have chosen the lavish life, a beautiful house, big paychecks, instead of being a just and upright ruler. <clears throat> unity unity is something that Salahuddin Ayyubi had it up here in terms of paramount importance and why was this? because he knew disunited, divided, we are weak easy to pick off we know that the numerous verses and the hadith of the Prophet where he emphasized the importance of unity the most famous one saying that we are one body. <coughs> My ummah are like one body. And when one part of it is hurt, that the rest of the body responds in fever and restlessness. Think about this. Why did the Prophet say, why did he give the example of just a family? I can move away from my brother. I can move away from my father. You can cut ties and move off. But if you're a body, can you cut a part of your body off? Can you? You can't, can you? You can't, you can't just be like, you know what, hand, I don't like you, I'm just going to chop my own hand off. So similarly, if you look at that comparison, the person compared us to a body, and one, one part of it's hurt, the rest of the body responds in sleeplessness and fever. So the, the importance of unity was key to success. And Salahuddin Ayyubi knew this. Hence why he spent 10 years trying to unify the Muslim lands and the armies and as the scholars said that he may have even fought more Muslims than crusaders in that 10 year period. Today the Muslim world is divided into 57 plus countries, weak, in the pockets of foreign rulers, on the paycheck of the modern day crusaders. That's the situation we find ourselves today. But on a more positive note, what's the state of the Ummah, the general layman, the average Abdullah and Fatima on the road? I personally would argue that Alhamdulillah there's hope, there's hope within the Ummah, the general lay person. I think that they want exactly what Salahuddin Ayyubi wanted, the liberation of Jerusalem, for it to go from a state of weakness to strength but more importantly also like Salahuddin Ayyub ask yourself this how am I going to answer to Allah on the day of judgment when I am accounted about what I did on this earth during my time to change that situation what did I do what was my contributions 
Is there hope? Is there any hope to see the liberation of Jerusalem and Masjid Al-Aqsa? Absolutely. Absolutely. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his beloved Prophet promised us victory. And pessimism is not from the Sunnah of the Prophet. It's not befitting for Muslims to be negative and pessimistic and downtrodden and defeated. No. Our hope must remain high, our optimism must be high. We must believe in what Allah and His Messenger promised us. However, however, we don't just believe in this promise as an abstract theory. We believe in this promise and tie the camel from our end and do what we can within our capability. Regarding solutions, there's some, let's try ending on some positive notes, inshallah. Regarding solutions, <coughs> Salahuddin Ayyubi, his character was that he was deeply religious, deeply spiritual, that he was a man of substance and action. He was a balanced man. Similarly, I stand here today and I will tell you all, or advise you all rather, that in our endeavours, to assist the Muslims of Palestine and Muslims across the world generally who are occupied and oppressed, killed, do not go to extremes. And when I mean extremes, I mean don't just seclude yourself or isolate yourself to bettering yourself, to improving yourself as a Muslim and making dua and do nothing in the physical practical sense. On the flip side, don't just busy yourself with demonstrations and, and uh, petitions and lobbying your MP and accounting your rulers and doing charity whilst not remembering Allah to grant us victory to assist us. Find that balance, brothers and sisters. Do not go to extremes. Do not do these things in isolation. You need each other. Let me give you an example. Someone who just is concerned with just bettering themselves and making dua and doing nothing else thinking that's enough it's like a starving man a starving man who locks himself up in a room and thinks that sustenance and food will fall from the skies in opposition to this the one who's always engaged in activity and activity and busy himself with x y and z but never thinks about asking Allah for assistance Never asking the one who will grant the victory for victory. It's like a ram, it's like a bull continuously ramming a wall, thinking that its horns are going to remain intact. Find that balance. Find that balance between spirituality, self-betterment as a Muslim, dua, and action. Tie the camel and then leave the result to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In terms of tangible things that you can do, Boycotting Israeli goods is, is a laudable thing. Assisting the BDS movement is rewardable, it's a good thing. Attending demonstrations and protests is a good thing. Petitions to, you know, arrest Netanyahu when he enters here is a good thing. You know, it, it, it shows good sentiments. Lobbying your MPs and accounting your rulers or Muslim or Zionists is a good thing. You have to account your rulers. You have to account your MPs. Even though many of them are in the paycheck. Yeah, of, of, of the Zionist lobby groups. Account them. Ask them. Hey, we voted you into power. What are you doing to convey our thoughts and our concerns in the House of Parliament? And say to you, you know, <coughs> we should fight for a two-state solution. No, 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 no. I'm not going to stand here and say to you, after giving you the story of the AUB, that we should set up for a two-state solution. No, let me tell you why. This land was stolen. This land is currently being occupied. Palestinians have been killed. They've been removed. They've been forced out of their homes. And until this matter is resolved, there will never be free Gaza or free Palestine. None of that will happen. There will never be peace in the Middle East until this matter is resolved. And I'm about to say something, and I apologize in advance if I offend anyone. Pro-Palestine activism has become a form of popular culture, especially among students. It's 
especially among students, it's become trendy, cool. It's become cool because the non-Muslims talk about it. It's cool because the lefties, you know, they support us. So therefore, this gives us some kind of ijaz, some authority to jump on the bandwagon, bang on the, the Palestinian face paint, the kafir scarves, the, the, the slogans and, and the lot of it. And yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Wallahi adheen. This matter of Jerusalem and generally speaking, the oppression of the Muslims is far greater for a Muslim than this. It's a part of our aqidah, about our, about our loyalty and our allegiance to Allah, the Messenger, and the Muslims. Look beyond the meager things like face paint, not just buzzed up, oh yeah, yeah, free, free Palestine. You know how many times I've asked a student, yeah? I'm not even sure, generally some Muslims, yeah, akhi, you know, you're saying free Gaza, yeah? What does free Gaza mean? Explain to me what free Gaza means. Or free, free Palestine, down, down, Israel. What do you mean by that? <laughs> Please explain to me. What, what, what do you mean? Clueless. It's not their fault. The sentiment is right. The feeling is good. Channel it. Understand the objective. Why am I doing this? Why am I speaking out against the oppression that's taken against that's happening against my brothers and sisters? Why am I exposing the crimes of the Zionist entity of Israel? Why? Why? Because this is what we have to do as Muslims. This is what Allah and His Messenger has instructed us to do. Remember this. This is our objective. Why do we do it? Do we want to be that bull that I was talking about? This continues ramming the wall but hasn't got a clue. Hasn't got a clue. Why are they doing it? The reason why <laughs> As Muslims, we should speak out against the crimes of Israel, raise awareness about the oppression of our Muslim brothers and sisters in Palestine. The reason why we do all those things that I've listed there, demonstration of protest, petitions, lobbying and accounting, giving charity, all of that stuff, which is good and has to carry on, it's because this is pleasing to Allah that we are doing our duty with the best of our capability, whatever within our remit that we can do, we're doing this with that objective in mind. Not because it's cool to join a 100,000 march demonstration. Not good because I get to put on a cool scarf and paint my face with, with a Palestinian flag. No, 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 no. That's not why we do it. But whilst we do all those things, whilst we do all those things, going back to the solution, I would argue and the q and A, I'll happily discuss anyone who wants to challenge me that the solution, the liberation of Jerusalem can only be won in the form of a military liberation. And before anyone starts thinking about cutting any tickets to Jordan and joining Hamas or something like that, just relax. Yeah? Yeah. The term military, military, has a sense of officialdom. Meaning, military is something that's part of a state. It's a state institution. Not a militia, not a resistance movement. So, when I say that the liberation of Jerusalem and Asham, inshallah, will happen in the form of a unified military effort, that means that everything that Salah al Ayyubi did has to be done as a precursor to a certain degree in our time. So that means the Muslims being united. That means the rulers to a certain degree have to be united. To a certain degree there has to be one ruler. But whether this happens in our lifetime or not, Allah alam, we pray to Allah that this does happen in our lifetime. We ask Allah that we do witness this. And we ask Allah that we are given the opportunity to contribute towards this liberation. So remember that. The liberation of Jerusalem will happen through military means. Not in the current state that it's in. Not through any kind of small resistance movements. It's not certainly not going to happen at the hands of ISIS or any other groups. It will happen from a unified, unified, sincere effort from the Muslim world. And to conclude, the last words, that J word. You might want to cut this from the video if you want. <laughs> One of the Sahabi, one of the Sahabas once asked Prophet Sallam, Ya Rasulullah, tell us about the most noblest form of jihad. And the Prophet Sallam responded, a true
true Sunnah Jihad is a word of truth at the face or in front of a tyrannical ruler. Mentioned in Musnad Ahmed, hadith number 18,449. So keep this hadith in mind when you are doing everything that you do, when you're accounting your MP, when you're accounting someone who's pro-Israel, when you're accounting someone who tries legitimizing the violence committed against the Muslims of Palestine, remember this hadith when you remind the Muslim rulers about their duty, keep this in mind, inshallah, when you go about your endeavors to assist the Muslims of Palestine and the wider Muslim world, inshallah. Zakhmullah khair, thank you for your patience. Guys, I think we're going to have a 10 to 15 minute question and answer session now, if you'd like to ask. Uh, on the way here, I uh, interacted with a brother who uh, mentioned that uh, this would be quite a controversial subject, and quite a quite a controversial speaker. Uh, my question is, why is it that in uh, that such mainstream ideas, which are found in all of the uh, books of history and all of the books of fiqh, it seems to be uh, it seems controversial? Okay, <coughs> a very good question. The brother has asked, why are concepts? Such as jihad, right? Such as jihad, such as khilafa, such as sharia. Why are these things so controversial? I'll tell you why. Because these concepts, if practiced, if implemented properly, it poses a threat. It's a world view in on itself. If the Muslim world and the rulers implemented and applied and executed jihad the way it's supposed to be done, there would be no story. There would be no Bashar al-Assad. There would be no oppression in the Muslim world. And the fact that Islam as a holistic, as a complete religion, poses that ideological threat to Western liberal democracy, or some may call it the New World Order, or whatever you want to name it, it is perceived as a threat. Historically, it's always been perceived as a threat. As mentioned in the, in the story of Salah al So topics and concepts such as jihad, such as khilafa, these things remind and it resonates with the past and it poses um, a physical threat to the existing order, to the existing norms of the international setup. And I would argue that that's why it's so controversial. Also, post 9-11, post 7-7, post Woolwich, now with ISIS, these terms, mind my French or English, it's not a swear word, it's become bastardized. These terms have become poisonous. That you can't even talk, mention these words without being labeled an extremist or an Islamist. But I would say you t we take ownership of these words. What is jihad? Jihad fi sabilillah in the Quranic context, in the physical context, is about removing obstacles of injustice. It's about establishing the peace and harmony of Islam. It's not about mindless violence. The, acts, the engagement of war in Islam has particular rules and regulations. You do not transgress against the non-combatants, the men, women and children who are not fighting you. You don't even harm a tree. Yeah? Now tell me, tell me, since World War I, what happened to these modern wars? Tell me where has there been a sanctity of life? Where has there been a respect for trees or children? There isn't. But because these terms have become demonized, they've become disgusting words that we can't even use. I would argue the reason why this has happened is to block an intellectual revival within the Muslims. And they wake up and understand their history. And when they understand their history, they take the lessons from their history and apply it. But they realized that, you know, Salahuddin Ayyubi did make jihad to liberate Palestine. He did. He unified the Muslim lands. So I would say two things. Back to your question. A. It poses an ideological threat if it was to ever manifest. And therefore, it threatens the existing world order or international setup. Secondly, it's political convenience. 
and a yardstick to beat the Muslims with from even waking up and coming in contact with their history. Because you're right. Stuff like jihad, khilaf, sharia, and so forth and so forth, these are deep rooted in our scripture. Classical scholars and contemporary scholars have discussed this in great detail. To even deny these things, to deny these concepts, would be very dangerous. So, I would say, for far too long, we've allowed others to take ownership of these terms. For too long, we've allowed ourselves not to become educated about these concepts. That if and when it is attacked, that we're unable to defend it. So I would say, educate yourselves. Look into our history. Find what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger said about these concepts, these unspoken words that we can't even say these days without being labelled. Look into it. And I hope that answers your question, Akhir. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, as alaykum, bro. Um, so, <laughs> he's my actual brother. He's my actual brother. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the question I'd like to ask is, the question itself is probably uh, controversial from an Islamic point of view. Um, you spoke of, you know, such uh, concepts in Islam like Sharia, uh, Jihad and um, Islamic State, these kind of things being, uh, if you uh, encourage them or if you speak of them in a positive form, uh, they are seen as uh, rallying existential threat towards the West and liberal democracy, right? Yeah. Um, so how would you then advise students or any Muslim really, young Muslims, old Muslims, living here in the UK, mm. to reconcile these kind of um, uh, efforts Islamically, like speaking the truth, accounting tyrant rulers, yeah. um, unity, political unity, um, spiritually, how would you reconcile that spiritually? Because on one hand, doing that, we're considered uh, we're considered contributing towards being rebels, non-violent extremists, mm. and on the other hand, we need to do it Islamically. So, how, what advice would you give to students to reconcile that spiritually? As in, we could do it and feel Islamic about it, opposed to do it and feel radical. Yeah. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions that the Muslims, and this this, this is like a condition, a stipulation, <coughs> as what defines us as a people. That we are a people that enjoy in good and forbid evil. That is like our ethos, that's like our world view. We enjoy in what's good and forbid what's evil. If we can change something with our hands, do it. If we can do something with our mouth, do it. And the lowest form of Iman is to hate it from within. So as long as we understand those concepts, that spiritual concept that Allah will account me on the day of judgment. I will be accounted for all that I did and all that I did not do. And as a Muslim, our job is to enjoy in good and forbid what's evil and try stopping evil with our hands, our mouths, or hate it within. And with that in mind, I don't think there should be an issue or, or like a fear of doing it. However, the fear does exist. Unfortunately, that fear does exist amongst many Muslims, especially students. May Allah bless you all. May Allah make it easy for you all. I understand the pressures that Muslim students face at universities. Would not prevent becoming statutory. Would not Muslim students being spied on. I understand all of this. But remember that Allah is the best of planners. That Allah and His Messenger have promised us a victory. That we are a people who enjoy in good and forbid what's evil. And that as soon as we stop doing that, there will be fitna and facade and corruption in the land. That we have testified that there is none other that should be worshipped besides Allah and Prophet Muhammad is his messenger. Our shahada. Keep all of this in mind. This is what defines us as a character. We can be active. We can be good citizens. A majority of Muslims live in the UK, we are, we're fantastic citizens. We've been living here since the 40s, 50s and 60s. Law-abiding citizens, tax paying, loads of Bengali restaurants, taxi services, corner shops, you name it. We've lived in relative peace. It's in relative, we've lived in absolute peace. But we have a duty to enjoy in what's good and forbid what's evil. And this is a duty that's upon all of us. Give da'wah, propagate the faith. Deal with misconceptions. Learn the argumentations so you can defend these concepts. 
If you don't educate yourself, then you won't know how to defend these concepts. And if you don't know how to defend these concepts, then these concepts will be continue to get demonized. So from a spiritual perspective, my younger brother, <laughs> ultimately you have to understand that we will return to Allah. And we will have to answer to Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that as Muslims, we enjoin in good and forbid what's evil. And if we hold that dear to us, and understand that that principle is our world view, then there should be no issue, inshaAllah. Fear is prevalent. In light of the Paris attacks, in light, and then before that, religion, very, very testing times for us. Very testing times. But, you have to educate yourself. You have to be brave. As Sister Maryam said, you have to aspire to be the Salahuddin in your respective fields. If you're studying medicine, then defend the honor of Islam and give da'wah in every given opportunity. If you're doing that fancy computer degree or that the brother said in the back, you know, or if you're doing arts and humanities, whatever it may be, in whatever respective fields that you're involved in, you are an ambassador of Islam. You are a defender of Islam. Live up to that. You won't be able to do that if you don't educate yourself, if you don't seek knowledge. I hope that answers your question. Um, I have two questions. Firstly, what's the um, religious significance of Masjid Al-Aqsa to the Jewish people? And um, does it have any sort of historical truth? Do their claims have any historical truth? And um, secondly, are there any books or biographies of the Salahim that, you'll read, that you would recommend written by uh, Muslims or not? So answer your first question. Um, why is uh, Jerusalem important to the Jewish people? Um, believe it or not, those reasons that I mentioned in the first slide, besides the first Qibla of the Muslims and the station of al Isra al Miraj, very similarly, they understand that it was a place where many of the prophets of Bani Israel visited. In fact, all of them visited. Many of them are buried there. So there are a lot of similarities as to why uh, Jerusalem is very important to the Jewish people because our prophets are the same. Ba Isa alayhi salam and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, the prophets are the same. And equally in their scripture, equally in their scripture, Jerusalem is spoken very highly of. It's a reference, it's a holy place. Um, in terms of the exact intricacies, I can't really say, but I can say that for many of those reasons which are not specific to Islam, there are very similar. That is also a place for the prophets of Bani Israel. Secondly, are there any books of Salahuddin Ayyubi that you can read? I would recommend two books and two lectures. The first book, and it comes in a number of volume, volumes, is Ibn Shaddad. Ibn Shaddad is the chronicler, the biographer of Salahuddin Ayyubi. He was a man who followed him very closely, went with him everywhere. Literally, you should ask him questions while he's doing things like, why are you doing this? Or, Did you ever consider this? So Ibn Shaddad, it comes in many volumes. That was the first biography written about Salahuddin Ayyubi. I would also recommend reading the books or the accounts of William of Tyre. William of Tyre, as I mentioned in my talk, was the biggest and most famous crusader chronicler. And he mentioned uh, and spoke about Salahuddin on numerous occasions. Um, so that gives you a very authentic, timely to that respect, uh, original understanding of what kind of mass of Ayyubi was. And I would argue to a certain degree that you may not even find much differences in the way they describe Salahuddin Ayyubi's personality. I'd also recommend to look into the life of Nur al-Din al-Zengi. That really, brothers and sisters, you cannot discuss the life of Salahuddin Ayyubi if you don't understand the life of Nur al-Din al-Zengi. Regarding lectures, I would recommend Dr. Uthman Latif's Life of Salahuddin Ayyubi or Sheikh Zahir Mahmoud's Life of Salahuddin Ayyubi. Two fantastic talks which I even used to prepare for this one. And they go into historical as well as theological perspectives of Jerusalem. Uh, Ever since we were young, you can see turmoil in the Middle East. 
I'll address that point by point. Do intervene if I miss anything out. The first statement you made was, I believe, about the reasons why the Middle East is not stable, the endless number of wars, occupation, and whether this is a time where holding on to Islam is not holding on to hot coal. Or what Prophet followed, concluded that hadith with, why is there instability and continuous wars and occupation in the Muslim world? One would have to study history. One would have to go back to World War I. One would have to go back to the history of European colonialism. One would have to go back right up until the hadith of Prophet Muhammad when he said that there will come a time, so you will have Khilafah, Rashidun, when you have it, and that Allah will take it away from you. Then you will have kingship, then Allah will take it away from you. Then you will have tyrannical rule, and Allah will take it away from you. Then the Khilafah will be revived upon his methodology. So Prophet he prophesied this anyway. And he, in other hadith where he said there will come a time when the nations will gather like a pack around the, like, to feed on his prey. We know this, we know the Prophet spoke about is that there will come a time of turmoil. More turmoil is to come. If you talk about the wars of the, the end, near the end of times, it's going to be far worse. The fitna, the facade, the occupation, the oppression. This is going to happen, it's going to continue to happen, but, but, Allah has promised the Muslims victory. We don't know when that is. We don't know when that is. We have some indications as to the precursors that will take place nearing this time. Some would argue that all this fitna, bloodshed, is a process of purification. It's a process of purification whereby the Ummah is being tested. That so many are being martyred. That it's a time where the Ummah is being tested and therefore something great will come out of this turmoil. And I strongly believe that to a certain degree because at the time of Salah al Ayyubi, who we discussed today, it was like that situation. Muslim blood was very cheap. The lands were occupied. And out of the 88 years of occupation and oppression and turmoil, Allah granted his Nusra, his Nusra, his victory, and it came. So there will come a time where holding on to Islam, its values, its principles, its thoughts, its concepts, holistically totally will be very difficult. Yes, it's difficult now, but it will be far more difficult in the times to come. We have to understand history as to how we went from the Khulafa Rashidin to the fitna that happened between Ali and Muawiyah. 
the fitna that happened with the Khawarij, the fitna that happened in Karbala, what happened when during the Umayyads, then the Abbasids, then the Crusades, then the Mongols, then the Ottomans, then European colonialism, the cultural invasion, the ideological war, the centuries and centuries of the colonization of uh, Muslim India. You have to understand this, that it happened during a process of time. And it perfectly fits into the prophecy of the Prophet when he described that there will come a time where the Ummah will number many. They will number many, but yet we're going to get carved up and oppressed like we are nothing. So, that's a reality that we were well aware of. As to why we have the likes of Turkey, Pakistan, Egypt, with some of the strongest and <coughs> biggest armies. Yeah? I believe Pakistan and Turkey are in the top 10 in terms of physical soldiers, foot soldiers. And obviously the, the weapons, the warplanes, the F-16s, Number many, they're constantly buying it from America and Britain. But, again, a big but, and I will continue drawing similarities to the life of Salahuddin Ayyubi, is that the leadership, just like there were princes and kings at the time who had armies, had capable armies, but they were too, too immersed, too interested in their own worldly gains. If they were paying taxes to the Crusaders, they were fighting each other, but left the Crusaders. Similarly, we find that out the Muslim countries today are shackled by the loans of IMF. Are all the IMF and the World Bank, billions upon billions, if not trillions of dollars. We have the leadership in Pakistan, the leadership in Turkey. I know many have high aspirations for Erdogan and the AKP party. But the reality is that Turkey is a NATO member. A number of military bases caught in Turkey that are being used to bomb Syria. May Allah grant the Muslims of Turkey and Pakistan and Egypt the sincere within the army, the sincere generals within the army, those who have concern and compassion for the Ummah to, re to be revived, to wake up and to fulfill their duties. Because the sister rightly states We've got all the, the modern warfare, the fighter jets, the guns. But we're too busy shining them and not using them for nothing. But I will simply answer to your question, sis. It comes down to the leadership. They are all agents. They're all agents. They are either financially indebted to the West, to their colonial masters in Washington, London and Paris, <coughs> Hence why you get Sisi, who comes here, who removed Bursi, the first democratically elected leader of Egypt, kills 2,000 people in Rabat Adawiyah, and he gets welcomed like a king here. This is why President Modi comes here like a Maharaja prince, and yet he has the blood of the Muslims of India in his hands. This is why we have the President <coughs> of China, who is systematically trying to cleanse the Muslims of Xinjiang, so I guess welcome. This is why we see numerous leaders from the Muslim world who come here and are treated like kings. Mr. Cameron and Obama have no problems, no problems whatsoever with the beheadings that Saudi does. But he has a big problem with the beheadings that ISIS does. Because Saudi, they need that oil. They need those military weapon contracts. You know what I mean? That's why. <laughs> yeah? So there seems to be a level of double standard. And that brings me to conclude to your last statement, which is how is it that Muslim life has become so cheap? Muslims are being killed in their hundreds and thousands, yet we don't see no hashtags. Yet we don't see, um, what was the famous hashtag about Paris, when the Paris attacks happened? What is it? Jesse Charlie. No, Jesse Charlie was the one with the Charlie, the one after Paris. Pray for Paris. Pray for Paris. <laughs> there's no pray for Hamma, there's no pray for Gaza, there's no praying for Shishan. There's no praying for any of the Muslim cities. There's no praying for the Rohingya or the Muslims of the Central African Republic. There's no hashtags there. The sanctity of life, Muslim or non-Muslim, is very important, very dear. 
But there is a double standard. There is a selective outrage. That's because over the period of time, the life of the Muslim has become cheap. That massacre and pillaging, death and destruction has become such a norm. Has become such a norm in the region that people say we're just mere statistics. We're just mere statistics. Whereas the life of a Westerner is held of utmost importance. Hashtags, condemnations, locking arm marches after Charlie Hebdo, and all sorts. None of this. None of this for the Muslims. And again, this is a very politicized, propagandist implementation of the dominant narrative. Any, the general awam, the general public, the masses, right? BBC, Fox News, France 24 is their bread and butter in terms of where they seek their knowledge from. You have to understand that. Sometimes, again, we shouldn't be frustrated from the general public. The general public are just the masses who follow news and what they see on the news and very rarely question it. So, if on a daily basis they hear that the Muslims are barbaric, these Muslims are killing each other, they're doing all sorts, but something happened at the doorstep of Europe, naturally they will respond in hysteria with the knee-jerk reaction of all kinds of hashtags and so forth. So yes, to answer your question, apologies for going roundabout, is that Muslim blood has become very cheap. Um, war, violence, massacre, oppression, occupation has become so norm, such a norm in the Muslim world that it's not even a thing. The region is known as a violent place. When in fact, the region was the land of peace and prosperity for centuries. The Muslim land was where the, where the Jews went during the Spanish Inquisition. It was the land where Jews and Christians excelled, reached positions that were unheard of. We're only talking about the 20th century here. I'm talking about hundreds and hundreds of years. I'm not giving you a romanticized version of events. Yes, the Muslim world had numerous issues, sectarian, theological, and so forth. But, but, in comparison to Europe, which is constantly at war with each other, which is constantly at war with each other, hence look into the concept of Europe. The concept of Europe was when all the European kingdoms came and sat down with Yallah, man, we need to stop beefing each other. For too long, we've just been spilling each other's blood. That was actually one of the incentives for the Crusades. When Pope Urban sent out the call, he went, look, stop warring each other, go and fight the infidels, the Mohammedans. So whilst the moral arrogance, the intellectual arrogance of some Westerners and some Orientalists, and even some within our own Muslim community, say that, yeah, the Muslims are barbaric, the land is corrupt, yes, there is. But there's a precursor to it, there's a context to it. Many things happened which resulted in that. And that ultimately has a knock on effect in how Muslims are perceived. How Charlie Hebdo can get away with its institutional racism, its institutional Islamophobia, yet there seems to be a double standard when even a, a word is uttered the wrong way against other religious minorities without mentioning any names. <laughs> So, ultimately it's up to us, it's up to you, the Shabab, the youth, the students, to carry on raising their awareness, highlighting whenever this double standard occurs, whenever this selective outrage happens, to write about it, to talk about it, to challenge it, and to take control of the narrative. I hope that answers your question.